All right. So we're going to talk about a really short little segment of notes called blood evidence at a crime scene. So just some other aspects of things that we might be able to look at at a crime scene using blood. So if we don't see any blood, okay, so you get to a crime scene, you think that there should be blood around. Maybe you think there's been a cleanup. Maybe you know you have a victim that's been hurt, but then you go into the crime scene and you don't see any blood. So even with the most thorough cleaning, um, blood, blood leaves a residue that is difficult to remove. Luminol powder mixed with hydrogen peroxide is able to detect hemoglobin, so remember that's in our red blood cells, left behind by blood. So if you spray the area, um, and if the blood is present, it will luminesce for about 30 seconds. So that's kind of something that's a little different than the way they make it look on TV. It doesn't glow for that long, um, so you do have to be pretty quick about it. And once the luminol reacts to an old or new blood, it does destroy the blood, so then it cannot be tested later for like blood typing, DNA, that kind of thing. So you do have to be kind of careful. Um, it's not like, I feel like even in these pictures or the way you'd see it on TV, they, you know, they spray everything and it's blowing everywhere when really you more of likely you just want to kind of spray just in little small pieces around to find out where the blood has been cleaned up. So like if you're finding the bathroom, finding the kitchen, finding the bedroom, you know, you're just doing little sections at a time. You're like, oh, this is the area where it's glowing. So now I'm going to collect samples to send off um, instead of destroying all of it and putting luminol everywhere. You're just going to use it in small doses to kind of figure out where the blood might be. The basic idea of luminol is to review is to reveal blood traces with the light producing chemical reaction between several chemicals in a in the hemoglobin. So if you were in class, I usually show a demo. I think I'm going to show a demo of me doing lum luminol in class. Um, I have I have luminol. Um, I, I'm a little worried that I ran out of it last year, but I'm pretty sure there's still some in the cabinet. So if there is, I'm going to do a demo in class and maybe I'll record it and post it. But I mean, it is exactly how the pictures look. It glows a very bright blue. Um, as long as blood has been present. Now, if you can see the blood, okay, so you're seeing some blood stains. You walk in and there's some blood stains around. What do we do now? If the blood stains or drops are found, confirm that they are in fact blood. Because what if they're not? What if it's, there's lots of things that are red in color. So even though if you're pretty sure it's blood, you do need to check. There are many chemicals to test for the presence of blood. The Castle-Meyer test, swab turns pink. If blood is detected. So we're actually going to do a lab like that in class. It actually looks like that turns this pink color. So if blood is actually present, then the swab would turn pink. It's mixed with two chemicals on the swab with the blood. And if it turns pink, then probably it's blood. Um, it is a presumptive test, which means you're presuming it's blood because it's one of the things that it reacts with. But there are actually a couple things that Castlemeyer test would turn pink with. So it's still not um, absolutely 100% definite, but more than likely. So to be presented accurately and useful in court, blood stain evidence must be recognized, documented, preserved, and correct, correctly evaluated. So whenever possible, deliver blood or stained object to the lab immediately. If unable to deliver to the laboratory or if the object must be mailed, allow the stain to air dry completely before packaging. That's your goal is to let it air dry. Um, it helps with the blood creating mildew and things. So blood that is in pools should be absorbed by a gauze, so like soaking it up with some gauze and then allow to air dry. After it dries, it should be refrigerated or frozen as soon as possible. Blood should be taken to a lab as quickly as possible. Delays beyond 48 hours may make the sample useless. So you do have to get it there pretty quickly. It should be refrigerated and hopefully you can let it dry first. It just makes it less likely for it to be contaminated and create mildew. If not completely dry, label and roll in paper or place in brown paper bag or a box that's made of like cardboard paper material and seal and label the container. Place only one item in each container and never use plastic. So remember we learned this at the beginning of the year, um, putting in airtight plastic containers lets there not be an oxygen flow. Without that oxygen flow, it's gonna go start decomposing faster actually and creating mildew on the object, which would destroy the blood. If blood is present, we also need to determine that it's human, okay? So there is other things, there's other things that bleed. Um, and you do have to make sure it's human blood before we move forward the case. All mammals, except camels and llamas, Albana, have circular, unnucleated, so we said they don't have a nucleus, which means they don't have DNA, red blood cells. So if we're looking at some of those, like this and the one in the middle, is a human blood, it's just little red circles. They're pretty much perfectly round. So mammals generally are very round, not 
having any nucleuses in the middle. So they're just literally red circles pretty much for all mammals. They're going to be different sizes, like bigger circles to littler circles, but still red circles. Animals that are not mammals, so birds, fish, etc., have oval-shaped blood cells. So they're not as round. So like this one over here, this frog blood you can see is more oval in shape. And they have a nucleus in the center. You can you can see it. You can clearly see that there's something in the center of those blood cells of things that are not mammals. And they are more egg-shaped, more oval-shaped rather than round. And again, we'll do that in the lab as well. In class, we're going to see the blood slides. The ELISA test, I mentioned during the history part of our blood unit, right at the beginning, I said this came out in 1985. So the ELISA test uses antibodies that react to human blood to tell if it's mammal, if mammal blood is from humans. We can also do a test that way. So you can look at it under a microscope. You can also do the ELISA test and that'll tell you if it's human blood. However, in rare cases, it can be confused with the chimpanzee and gorilla because their blood types are just the most similar to ours. They're not exactly the same, but they are the most similar. ELISA is an abbreviation for enzyme linked, um, can't say that word actually, <laughs> immunosorbent assay. Okay, so long, long thing. We're just gonna call it ELISA. Um, it can test for AIDS. It can test for other bloodborne pathogens. It can tell if it's human blood. So it does a lot of tests for, for blood. Um, it can just detect and measure antibodies. So different types of antibodies that are in your blood fighting off things. And then lastly, yep, lastly, before we get to blood spatter, the crime scene investigation of blood. So this is kind of like the order of what I just talked about. So first, confirm the stain is blood. So either visualization with luminol. So we're going to find it with luminol. You're going to do the Castle-Meyer test to test for it. If you confirm the stain is human, so we, we figured out his blood, now we want to confirm it's human, and then you want to determine the type. So is it A, B, O? And that's kind of the order breakdown. 